Okay, you may proceed. This contains um, pictures of the skull. I would ask that the court re-instruct the media and everyone present about the restrictions on photographing or recording this in any way. Okay. Uh, the media is quite well aware of uh, the two pool folks, uh, one from in session and uh, the Orlando Sentinel understands that they are to pixate and blur. So they are quite well aware. Also, uh, there should be no taking of cell phone photographs by the media of any of these things. And uh, there's an absolute prohibition on the public for taking out cell phones, period. If you take them out, they will be seized and confiscated. Okay, let's proceed, Mr. Ashton. To make sure this is published for the court. Testifies to how he plans on. Shouldn't the witness proper what his testimony is going to be in relation to this as well? I'd be happy to do whatever the court wants, other than how it was made. I, I, I didn't think that went to the 403 analysis, but. Well, I thought you wanted me to look at the tape. What is it you want me to do? That's fine. We can start with this. Other... We can look at the tape, and then we can have him testify as to how he made it. OK? Yes, sir. All right, let's proceed. That completes the video, Judge. OK, a couple of questions. Sir. What is the relevancy of this? The, the issue in this case, <clears throat> as phrased by the defense and by the case, is whether the duct tape in this case was, in fact, the cause of death. This demonstrates that a single piece of duct tape, and the testimony will show there was three, was sufficient to be placed over the nose and mouth of Kaylee Marie Anthony, thus ending her life. This is a graphic, an unfortunately graphic representation, but it's the only method of establishing that. Just so the court knows, the, um, the, the, the reason the skull is in the picture is because the skull has a scale, the tape has a scale, and in order to um, make the skull match the photograph, it was necessary to have the skull so that we know that the photograph is in one-to-one -one ratio with the tape. That's the reason that the skull has to be there. Um, and that is the relevance of it. And I do believe that the defense is contesting whether the tape is the murder weapon. And I would submit that this is evidence that it is. Mr. Baez. I don't know where we're at, but I've been hearing a lot of testimony about chloroform being the cause of death or, or the, the state's theory of what caused this child's death. And then today it's duct tape. Uh, we seem to find ourselves in a position of let's throw everything against the wall and see what sticks. This disgusting uh, superimposition is nothing but a fantasy that is not supported. Number one, it's, uh, it's not supported by anything that can't be testified to. It, is, it goes to the very root of 403 that is substantially out any probative value of this video as to the measurements of what uh, Mr. Ashton just finished arguing, that it's sufficient, the measurements are sufficient to, uh, to cause this death. If that's what they want to argue, I understand that. Uh, however, the proper way of doing that would be, of course, someone testifying as to the measurements, someone t testifying as to the anatomy of this child uh, due, or, due to her age, and that would be, in my uh, estimation, through a medical examiner or, the, or an anthropologist. Uh, Just how, a second. Yes, sir. You might want to reference uh, McDuffie versus State, 977 second, 312, 2007 decision of the Florida Supreme Court that may have a similar application here, but I need to reread it. It's been a while since I've read it. You 
Uh, in addition, I think just it, just a second. Let me finish. I want to be able to hear you, and I want to be able to get this this print of steel print. Case is twenty six pages long. All right, you may proceed. Yes. Uh, if 403 was ever created for a scenario, it would be this scenario. The probative value is certainly outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice, confusion of the issues, misleading the jury, and, key, and keenly uh, needless presentation of cumulative evidence. This, uh, there has been no testimony, or can there be any testimony, that this was in fact this duct tape was, in fact, in this position as described and, and reflected in this video. Uh, in addition, I would also cite Pierce versus State, and that is a fourth DCA case, 97. Uh, it's a 97 case at 718 Southern 2nd, 806, okay. where it clearly shows that uh, the pre presentation must be relevant and it must fairly and accurately reflect the oral testimony offered and that it is an aid to the jury's understanding of the issue. Well, there's not going to be any oral testimony that this, this duct tape was in this position on this child's face. There can't be any. And there isn't any. And certainly uh, Dr. Warren could never testify to that. There were three pieces. One was found nine feet away. Okay, let's do this. Let me hear Dr. Warren's testimony. So let's put him on the stand and let's hear it. And then I can better make a, an informed decision. This would be a proffer, so there's really no need for you to make any objections at this point, Mr. Baez. It would help it go quicker so I can hear what the man has to say. Please state your name, sir. My name is Michael Warren, W A R R E N. And you're a forensic pathologist, a forensic anthropologist, is that correct? Yes, sir. Where do you work? I'm an associate professor at the University of Florida and director of the CA Pound Human Identification Laboratory. I've slowed down, doctor, so with this technical stuff, <laughs> it makes it difficult for court reporters. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I am Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Florida and Director of the C.A. Pound, which is a man's name, C. Addison Pound Human Identification Laboratory. All right. We'll, we'll skip your qualifications and just jump right into the issue. Okay. Um, in prep, were you involved in the original investigation of this case, and did you work with Dr. Schultz in preparing his report and analysis in this case? Yes, sir. And did you actually participate in examining uh, the skull and other bones involved in this case? I did. Now, getting directly to the point, um, <clears throat> at some point, discussions began about the issue of the duct tape and establishing whether it could be the weapon that caused death. Correct? That's correct. Now, how was this video superimposition created? It was created uh, by taking photographs that we had taken uh, during our examination of uh, the decedent's skull, and uh, also photographs taken of the tape by the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation, and a photograph that was found on uh, the internet that was appropriate in terms of the orientation of the child's face uh, to uh, the photograph that we had of the skull. All right. Now, why is it necessary to use a picture of the skull and the face in order to do this? Both the photographs of the skull and the photograph of the tape have photographic scales in there. Uh, and those scales uh, are used then to 
uh, make sure that uh, the, the size of each of those images uh, are exactly comparable. Uh, the face uh, has no scale uh, in it. So if we're going to superimpose the tape onto the soft tissue of the face, there's no way to do that unless we first uh, uh, match the, the face to the skull in terms of sizing uh, and uh, aligning that. And then by using the, uh, the scale in the, uh, the tape, we're able then to superimpose that onto uh, the, the soft tissue. So would it be fair to say that by using the skull, you're able to make sure that the face is in one-to-one -one with the tape? I had to use the skull, yes. I had to use the skull. Now, while you can give estimates, let me rephrase that. Is it possible, is it possible without this superimposition for you to precisely determine the distance between the end of Kaylee's nose and the bottom of her chin. It is using the scale in the photograph. We can do that. Without that, though, would you be able to? No. Are there certain um, rough estimates that you can make based upon um, research about the average distances in a child of that size and et cetera of that area? There are data out there. Um, previous studies, um, studies called anthropometry. Uh, which is the measurement of living people uh, for children. And uh, one particular uh, study in 1977 done by the University of Michigan and the Highway uh, Safety uh, Division has some measurements, but not the measurements that we needed from the landmarks uh, that are in question. So to your knowledge, would there be any other way to demonstrate that the duct tape could cover both her nose and mouth other than this process? There's not. Um, other than using, again, anthrop anthropometric measurements, uh, those are populational data. Uh, those populational data take into account uh, the variation uh, that we see in humans. Uh, when you are applying populational data to a single individual, uh, you're basically using populational means and applying them to, uh, to a you know, single person. Uh, if you can do if you can do your measurements and do your work on the individual in question, uh, then it's a more elegant approach uh, to that, and really the only way in this case to do it. Unless the council has that's all the questions I have for the proffer. Mr. Baez, sir. Sir, Mr. Ashton talked about discussions about the duct tape being the murder weapon, correct? You recall that? I don't recall direct um, questions from Mr. Ashton about the duct tape being the murder weapon. The very first question just now that he brought up were mm -hmm. these discussions. Discussions between me and, and uh, Dr. Uh, Garavaglia and Dr. Schultz, yes, because the, the, the tape was seen. Uh, and Mr. Ashton also had these discussions with you, did he not? I don't remember him talking about that being the murder question or the murder weapon. I remember him asking uh, and, and the question being whether or not it's possible that that tape could cover both the, the uh, nasal and oral airway. Okay. And when did that discussion take place? Early on, uh, during probably the first day that I was there, uh, we started talking about uh, you know the possibility of whether that tape could have covered both airways. And this is the first day you were there, you were having these discussions with Mr. Ashton? No, I have, had not met Mr. Ashton at that point. No, that was just with Dr. Dr. Caravaglia and Dr. Schultz. And later Dr. on, Oates this happened? Well. Later on, yeah, I think it was I that uh, suggested uh, that we, we do the superimposition uh, to, to demonstrate uh, the possibility of that tape covering both airways. And who made the suggestion to you? I, think I made the suggestion, I think. Okay, to who? Uh, to Mr. Ashton. Okay, so you suggested it to Mr. Ashton uh, while considering the prosecution of this case? While, excuse me? While considering the prosecution of this case. Yes. Okay. And you weren't present when the duct tape was removed from the skull, were you, sir? No. Okay. So you never saw where this duct tape was posi positioned near the hair or anything like that other than a photograph. That's true. Okay. And, of course, the photograph that you saw are the ones that are admitted in evidence, correct? Yes, sir. And they're the ones that are attached to her skull. I mean, her uh, hair mat, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, not to her skull. Not to her skull. Right. Now, the hair mat is underneath her skull, is it not? object to the relevance of this to the proper to the 403 issue. I thought we were not going to have objections. 
Well, let's get to the point. I don't want you to do your entire cross-examination. I just want, we're here to determine a full three issue. Yes, sir. I, I'm tying it all together here. Just okay, if I let's can get have just there. a moment. Mm -hmm. um, the hair mat was underneath Kaylee's skull, correct? It was nestled at the base of the skull, correct? Okay. And normally hair is not on the bottom of a skull. It's usually on top. Uh, decomposed skulls, yes, the hair okay. can, can slump. And, and but I'm talking about anymore. when a person's alive. Yes. All right. Just like in the photograph, she's alive, her hair's on top. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there's no scale on her face in that photograph, is there? No. Okay. And you don't even know how old Kaylee was when that photograph was taken. That's true. And this is just some photograph you took it, you took off the internet. Correct. Okay. So to fairly and accurately have this depiction, you would of course need to know how large the child is, correct? No, I would have to, to have knowledge of the landmarks of the face and how they fit uh, and the relationship of the soft tissue to the skull to, to adequately scale that. But children grow fairly rapidly, don't they? They do. Okay, and mm -hmm. she could have been much older or much larger in that photo in at the time of her death than was in that photograph, correct? The photograph to me looked like it had been taken fairly uh, recently prior to her disappearance. It just looked that way to you, correct. but you don't know for sure. It's certain. not an it's not an it's not an infant's photograph, in other words. Yeah. Doctor, uh, what is the purpose of this demonstration? The purpose of the demonstration is to uh, illustrate that it is possible that the tape, the width of the tape would cover both the child's nose and the oral, uh, the, the mouth. A skull was utilized. Explain to me the necessity for the skull, doctor. Okay. Um, we took the photograph of the skull and a, a frontal uh, view of the skull with a scale, a pho photographic scale. Um, we also have a photograph of the skull or the uh, tape taken by the FBI that also has a scale in that. By using both the, the skull and the tape and overlaying those images, with 50% opacity in this software program. You basically can take those two and you can make those scales the same size so that you know that the size of the skull relative to the size of the tape is real, that those, that those match. There's no scale in the photograph, but I can scale the face to the skull by using anatomical landmarks. So once we have the orientation of the photograph and we have that photograph scaled to the skull, now we have, um, we're able to, to move from the, the scale in the skull to the scale in the tape. Uh, and, and if we're going to, yes ma'am, uh, we're, we're able to, once we have the skull uh, scaled to the photograph, then we're able then to superimpose the tape, which has also been scaled to the skull over the, the image with the soft tissue. Now, Doctor, the skull that was used was the actual photograph of the skull that you received from the medical examiner's office? Yes, sir. Okay. Will this uh, animation aid you in explaining your testimony to the jury? It will, It'll, uh, in terms of whether or not it's possible that that single question, is it possible that that tape covered both the nose and the mouth? I think uh, it illustrates that it is, in fact, possible that it did. Without that animation, would you be able to do that, sir? I would be able to testify based on my knowledge of um, anthropometry and the literature that it is, in fact, possible that it did without using the animation, yes. Okay. What are the advantages of, or disadvantages, sir, of not utilizing the animation? Uh, the disadvantage is it takes um, it takes that illustration and the science out of my explanation to the jury. In other words, they'd have to trust that, that I um, am familiar with the, uh, with the data. Um, and when I tell them uh, that you know, the, the tape, in fact, the width of the tape, you know, which is 1.75 centimeters, and the anthropometric measurements between those landmarks, that, that in fact that would 
that would cover both of those. Okay. Um, so thank you. Anything else? Just one small thing. Um, based upon looking at the skull and looking at the photograph, is it your opinion as a forensic anthropologist that that they are close close in time? In other words, if there hasn't been significant growth in between the photograph and the skull picture. Yes. All right. I have no further questions. Would you like him to step down or just? The witness can stand down. And Mr. Baez, the case that you want the court to take notice of is Pierce versus State. Yes, sir. 718 7 second 803, a yes. 1997 decision by the Fourth District Court of Appeals. Yes, as well as, I, I'm sorry, I, I was just handed another one <clears throat> that, that uh, appears to be on point, and that is uh, Cam. Camporamore versus Brandon Pest Control at 721 Southern 2nd, 333. Okay. We will be in recess to about 315. I need to digest these cases. Okay. False imprisonment over in Volusia County. The court said the following in its opinion. Relevant evidence is defined as evidence tended to prove or disprove a material fact. But the relevant evidence is inadmissible if the probative value is substantially outweighed by dangers of unfair prejudice, confusion of issues, misleading the jury, a needless presentation of cumulative evidence. The proper application of section 94.3 requires a balancing test by the trial judge. Only when the unfair prejudicial prejudice substantially outweighs the probative value of the evidence must the evidence be excluded. Unfair prejudice has been described as an undue tendency to suggest decisions on an improper basis, commonly, though not necessarily, an emotional one. This rule of exclusion is directed at evidence which inflames the jury or appeals improperly to the jury's emotions. In performing the balancing test to determine if the unfair prejudice outweighs the probative value of the evidence, the trial court should consider the need for the evidence, the tendency of the evidence to suggest an emotional basis for the verdict, the chain of inferences from the evidence necessary to establish the material fact, and the effectiveness of a limiting instruction. The trial court is obligated to exclude evidence in which unfair prejudice outweighs the probative value in order to avoid the danger that a jury will convict a defendant based upon reasons other than evidence establishing guilt. The evidence which is being sought to be introduced is basically a superimposed photograph of the victim, the skull dealing with uh, the placement of uh, duct tape. The defense cites for the proposition that this evidence should be excluded. Two cases, Pierce versus State, found that 718, 7 second, 806, a 1997 decision of the Fourth District Court of Appeals. The Pierce case basically uh, dealt uh, with a computer-generated animation uh, illustrating the lead traffic homicide investigations investigators reconstruction of an accident uh, was published to the jury as demonstrative uh, evidence. Uh, 
The court in that case uh, found that this was a case of first impression dealing with co computer generated animations. Did its 403 analysis uh, and concluded that the videotape demonstration demonstrated no blood, replicated no sounds, uh, and found that through its 403 analysis uh, that they found no error in admitting, uh, no error by the trial court admitting the use of the computer-rated generated animation uh, to uh, the jury. Uh, this case here mainly dealt with the first time utilization of computer animated generation and was not helpful to the court in its analysis of the 403. The next case uh, cited uh, by uh, the defense is found at 72172-333. The Brandon Pest Control case, uh, a 1998 uh, decision of the Second District Court of Appeals. Uh, this case involved uh, a videotape that was of approximately 15 minutes duration that was taken at the residence in question. This particular tape demonstrated uh, extermination equipment uh, and pointed out uh, its utilization, uh, the drilling of holes and uh, injecting various chemicals throughout uh, the house. It also had some uh, computer produced animations throughout and the court uh, along with some narrations. Uh, the court concluded uh, that the narrations contained throughout and that this tape was basically a self-serving promotional tape. Uh, thus, uh, the court concluded that it should not have been introduced in evidence in this particular case. Although this opinion is not very long, it does not go through a 403 analysis. In looking at the factors talked about uh, in uh, McDuffie, uh, the court will make uh, the following uh, observation. One, the court needs to consider the need for the evidence. In this particular case, there has been made an issue uh, by cross-examination and direct examination dealing with the placement of duct tape upon the victim, Kelly Marie Anthony, and the location of this duct tape. The court will also note that uh, there is a nondescript picture of Kelly Marie Anthony, and there's also the utilization of the skull of Kelly Marie Anthony which the jury over the last two days has seen uh, several pictures of that particular skull. Uh, the skull does not uh, expose any blood, gore, or any things of that particular nature. The doctor has uh, indicated uh, that this will illustrate uh, his particular testimony and that it would aid and assist him in his testimony, uh, even though he said he could do without it, but he said it would be helpful. Does the evidence suggest an emotional basis for a verdict? Unfortunately, in homicide cases, evidence tends to be not so nice. Uh, but this particular piece of evidence, a live photograph of the victim superimposed with the skull, uh, does not have a tendency to suggest an emotional basis 
for a verdict. Is the evidence necessary to establish a material fact? Both sides have debated the relevancy of this duct tape and the placement of this duct tape. Thus, it is highly relevant to the determination for the trial fact to conclude based upon all evidence uh, whether or not this duct tape uh, was placed in a certain position. That is something for the trial fact and the trial fact uh, to determine. Therefore, based upon what has presented, been presented to this court, the court will permit the witness to testify. Last but not least, uh, pursuant uh, to uh, If requested by the defense, uh, pursuant to Pierce, I will give the following limiting instruction. This evidence is used only to illustrate the expert's opinion. Like all witnesses, uh, the experts, uh, correction, like all witnesses, Experts are like all witnesses with one exception. The law permits an expert to give his or her opinion. However, an expert's opinion is only reliable when given on a subject about which you believe him or her to be an expert. Like other witnesses, you may believe or disbelieve all or any part of the expert's testimony. Is the defense requesting that limited instruction to be given prior to the testimony of the expert. Yes, but we still do not waive our previous motion and objections, Judge. Okay. As to the other issues raised at the sidebar, uh, uh, we did not answer the question whether or not the state uh, had indicated that they were going to utilize it at trial, but it had been disclosed to the defense before, therefore, the court did a semi, what I call, Richardson analysis, since it violated my order uh, to determine what prejudice uh, by not telling them that they were going to utilize it, but it had been disclosed and the witness had had his deposition taken. Uh, with that, are there any other matters we need to take up prior to the jury returning? Any other matters on behalf of the state of Florida? Defense, Mr. Baez? Yes, sir. The only thing that I would uh, caution or I would advise the court as to what may also occur with Dr. Warren's testimony is that we have uh, cumulative testimony. He co-authored a report with Dr. Schultz. I would just, uh, I guess, bring... Uh, notice to the court that that may occur and uh, certainly that's something we would like to avoid and, and object to. If there are any issues uh, as to Dr. Schultz's testimony that the defense is not challenging, that that might be true by my understanding as the defense is not stipulating to the accuracy of anything that Dr. Schultz said, so I would submit that uh, additional testimony, the same issues would not be cumulative but would be relevant. Mr. Bias? In his, in his deposition, he clearly states that he defers to Dr. Schultz on these matters. Uh, why not bring in a third forensic anthropologist to say the same thing? And that's the problem. If he's going to testify to something different, certainly we would not have any objections to that. But to have to improperly bolster Dr. Schultz's uh, testimony by putting on more of the same thing. I think that is a huge limit because the very de definition. Can you cite one case that says having two experts testifying on the same topic is cumulative? I, I think that falls under the court's discretion. And I just wanted to uh, 
Usually what I do, Mr. Baez, if you have more than two, then you're going to have to justify to me why you need a third one. Because after two, it gets to be cumulative, in my opinion. Being our last forensic anthropologist. Okay. Anything else, folks? Not from the state. From the defense. Okay, let's return to jury. Well, could you please tell us your name? Michael Warren, W-A-R-R-E-N. And how are you presently employed? I am associate professor of the University of Florida uh, and director of the C.A. Pound Human Identification Laboratory. Can you explain to the jury what the C.A. Pound Human Identification Laboratory is? Uh, the Pound Lab is named after uh, the gentleman who endowed the laboratory. It is a working forensic anthropology laboratory. Uh, we are responsible for consulting with medical examiners in cases in which the decedent has become skeletonized, uh, burned, fragmented, uh, or otherwise unrecognizable. And how long have you been the director of that laboratory? About two and a half years. Kind of give us, if you would, your educational and work history leading up to your becoming the director of the Pound Human Identification Laboratory. Okay, I had a, had a prior career as a paramedic for 15 years. I returned back to graduate school in 1991, received my master's and PhDs at the University of Florida, training under William Ross Maples, a um, uh, forensic anthropologist. I did one year postdoc uh, after I received my doctorate in the Pound Lab. Uh, and was a visiting uh, professor until I was hired onto the faculty on August of 2000 as an assistant professor. <laughs> and did you work as an assistant professor at the University of Florida until you took, became an associate professor and then took over as the head of the laboratory? That's correct. Uh, since, since the year 2000 uh, up until uh, I became director, uh, which would have been in January 1st, 2009, uh, I was working in and out of the laboratory, consulting on cases, but also doing teaching and research uh, in the Department of Anthropology. Um, have you ever been qualified as an expert to give opinions in the area of forensic anthropology? I have. On, on how many occasions, if you can approximate? Probably 16 or 18 times. And in what type of jurisdictions? Just in the state of Florida, other states, federal? Uh, there's been two other states, Alabama and New York, uh, but mostly Florida. This time, Your Honor, I would submit uh, Dr. Warren as an expert in the area of forensic anthropology. No objections. Ladies and gentlemen, the jury, Dr. Warren, will be accepted as an expert witness in the area of anthropology. Now, do you have a, I don't know if you've called it a specialization or a special interest in forensic anthropology involving children? Uh, my doctoral research was in fetal growth and development, uh, the effect of pathology on, uh, on linear uh, bones of children, uh, but it, that was during the fetal period. Uh, any other interest I've had uh, has been involved in determination of age at the time of death, both in juveniles and adults. Now, did you become involved in the investigation of the death of Kaylee Marie Anthony? I did. How did you first become involved in this investigation? I was contacted by uh, Dr. Garavaglia and Dr. John Schultz uh, on December the 15th in 2008 uh, to come down and assist in the analysis of the remains. And did you travel to the District 9 Medical Examiner's Office for that purpose? Yes, sir. Now, in addition to examining the remains, have, did you also examine photographs taken of the remains as they appeared when they were found? Yes. I want to direct your attention to one specific um, area of that. Do you recall, either from the photographs or what you were told, that what the petition of the mandible was in reference to the skull when it was first found? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. All right. Uh, what was that position? Uh, the, manu the mandible was still articulated uh, at the glenoid fossa or mandibular fossa of the cranium. The mandibular uh, fossa at the, at the TMJ, the jaw joint. I'm so sorry. you say articulated, what does that mean? It means it was still in place, it was in situ. Ah, if you could slow it down just a little bit. I'll do that. Great assistance to us. Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, why is that noteworthy? 
Well, that particular joint is, um, is, a, is a regular uh, type of synovial uh, joint uh, with an articular disc. Uh, it's a very lax joint in that that joint allows movement of the jaw in two different directions, uh, both as a hinge and also to move anteriorly. There's nothing to hold that uh, jaw in place once the soft tissues decompose. So on surface depositions, uh, on cases in which remains are found on the surface of the ground, it would be um, very rare to find the jaw still articulated with the rest of the skull. And in your experience <clears throat> in cases that you have worked over your, the length of your career, have you ever had a case in which the jaw in, in an above ground deposition was still in that position in the skull? Yes. And what were the circumstances of that case? Uh, these are cases uh, that I worked when I was doing some human rights uh, work in the Balkans, uh, in Bosnia, uh, and I think also probably in Kosovo, uh, in which the uh, decedents had um, had tape over their over their face. Other than that circumstance, do you consistently find that the mandible has disarticulated from the the skull? Yes. And is that is that your experience, or is that experience? Withdraw the question. Now, you're familiar with the photographs of the position of the tape in reference to the the the, the mandible and the opening for the nose, the nasal aperture. Is that correct? The photographs, yes, sir. All right. Now, can you tell from the photographs whether the tape in 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 life would have been over the nose and the mouth? No. Why is that? Uh, the tape had moved. Now, did you attempt to determine whether it was possible that a single piece of duct tape of the type on the body would have been sufficient to cover both the nose and the mouth, even just one piece? I did. Right. Overall, what efforts did you make to determine whether a single piece would have been sufficient to cover both the nose and the mouth? Uh, two methods. I consulted the literature, uh, the scientific uh, studies that have been done on uh, growing children to try to figure out um, the distances, the normal distances between various landmarks on a child's face. Uh, the best piece of literature I was able to find involved uh, proper bolstering. I believe he's referencing the research he used in order to render his conclusion not the conclusions of other. Well, sustain. Just tell us what you did, doctor. All right. Okay. Without telling us what the literature. I'll rephrase. Said. Okay. Did you research the literature to determine um, estimate ranges of the distance between the tip of the nose and and? Well, let me rephrase. Which anatomical features were you interested in for this purpose? I was interested in uh, the, the nasal aperture. Uh, the very bottom of the nose uh, and uh, on the skull that's called um, the uh, nasospinale. So it's, it's, it's a point that we use when we do measurements. So it's basically the very root of the, of the, of the nasal aperture. Uh, and I'm also interested in uh, the bottom of the teeth and the oral airway. All right. And were you able to get um, estimates based upon Kaylee's age of what that might have been? Estimates, not using those exact landmarks, but uh, but in particular one landmark that is from the middle of the eye down to the bottom of the chin. All right. Now, what was the other method that you used? I used a method called video superimposition. And explain to the jury what, <coughs> pardon me, what has video superimposition been used for in forensic anthropology normally? It's primarily used um, to exclude the possibility that uh, the remains in question are those of a particular decedent. How, does, how do you do that if that's your purpose? You would take uh, the skull that you have of an unknown decedent that uh, is in the laboratory, uh, and you would take a, a photograph or a video of that skull, and you would take a photograph of the person, the putative decedent, the person that law enforcement or the medical examiner thinks that person may be, Mm -hmm. the last word, I didn't understand it either. I'm sorry. Putity. Excuse me? Your last word that began with a P. Pu putative. 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 Sorry, putative. Uh, the, the suspected decedent. Um, 
Go ahead. Slow, slow it down, yeah. doctor. It'd be very helpful. Okay, I'm sorry. So you, you take the skull uh, at that point. You also take the photograph of that individual. And uh, using a comparison uh, method where you are able to superimpose that image on top of the skull using anatomical landmarks, you may be able to make a statement on whether or not it's possible that the photograph is of the person that is the unknown skull that you have. What type of things are you comparing? You said anatomical landmarks, like, like what? <clears throat> you usually would uh, use something like the bottom of the teeth. Uh, we also use uh, what we call osteometric uh, points. So there are various points on the skull that we use when we do our metric analyses. So when we measure with calipers, and we use uh, certain anatomical landmarks. So it may be the edge of the orbits. It may be what we call um, there's a point at the root of the nose that we use, the top of the head and the contours of the uh, skull. Now, in this case, identification of the skull was not the issue that you were addressing, correct? Correct. <clears throat> How did you utilize that process in, in seeking information as to whether the tape could have covered the nose and mouth? I used that uh, technique in order to scale uh, the photograph of the skull with a photograph that was provided me uh, by the FBI of the tape. Both of those images had metric scales in them. So by superimposing one image on the other and making those scales the same size, we're able to know that those two, uh, that those two images are in, in terms of uh, scaling uh, correct. Okay, so that, that would help you put the tape over the skull, but how do you then determine how it would have been had the face been there? Well, we would, we would go back to the original uh, techniques that we've normally used superimposition for. Uh, that is to take the photograph of the skull, the photograph of the decedent, and then scale those using those anatomical landmarks. So you're, in, in essence, making the photograph of the live person the same size as the one-to-one uh, -one with the photo of the tape. Correct. Using the skull as the vehicle to do that. Exactly. <clears throat> and in this case, were you able to do that? I was. And did you review earlier state's exhibit QH mark for identification? Uh, we showed it earlier here during the yes. break. Okay. And does that fairly and accurately depict the video superposition showing that process? It does. And would it help you in explaining what this tells us about the ability of the tape to cover the nose and mouth? It would. This time you ought to move it down in state's exhibit <clears throat> QH, the uh, one file shown to the court, the movie file. Noting previous objections by the defense, and you renew those at this time, Mr. Baez? Yes, sir. It will be received in evidence as states numbered Is it queued up? Okay, prior to publishing this, I need to give you the following instructions, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. This evidence is to be used only to illustrate the expert's opinion. Expert witnesses are like other witnesses with one exception. The law permits an expert witness to give his or her opinion. However, an expert's opinion is reliable only when given on a subject about which you believe him to be an expert. Like other witnesses, you may believe or disbelieve all or any part of the expert's testimony. You may proceed. Oh, yes. Okay, it's published to the jury now. Play it. Dr. Warren, in the uh, video we just saw, we see the outline of the tape being moved up and down on the photograph. Yeah. What is the reason for that? Uh, to show that um, we don't know where the tape was, that it could have been higher, it could have been over both the nose and the mouth, but it could have been lower than that. So there, there is a position 
demonstrated there where the tape would have been only over the mouth and not occluded the nose. That's correct. But based upon that video and your own uh, research, would the single piece of tape, if applied in the position shown on the video, been sufficient to have covered the nose and mouth and made breathing impossible? Yes. No further questions. Cross-examination. May I please the court, Mr. Mr. Ashton. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, Dr. Warren. Good afternoon. Sir, you never saw, you were hired in pretty early in this case, were you not? I wouldn't use the term hired, I was consulted, yes. Okay, you were consulted <laughs> fairly yes. early in this case. Yes. And, but you never saw the duct tape while it was attached to the hair mat. That's true. And that's what it was attached to, the hair mat. Yes, there were strands of hair that were um, adhering. Okay. And the photograph that you use to do this, uh, what is it, a, a flash movie of sorts? That's a quick time movie um, from a photo sh uh, Photoshop program. And Photoshop's something that you use to design websites and things like that? It can be used in a lot of different applications. I'm not sure if you can use it for that. Okay. Uh, however, it doesn't give you precise measurements and things like that. That's something that you did based on your experience. It should give you very precise measurements if, if you're scaling. I mean, the image is the image. So, However, the photograph that you have of Kaylee, you grab that from the internet. Correct. And you don't have a scale on that photograph. Correct. And in fact, you don't even know how old Kaylee was when that photograph was taken. That's correct. Okay. And sir, the only reason you've shown this to this jury is because that may, that it, I, I guess it's to demonstrate that it's possible that this could have occurred. Correct. And when we say this could have occurred, I mean, it's possible that a piece of duct tape could have covered her mouth and her nose. Yes. Okay. And you're not testifying in any way that that's actually what happened. No, I'm not. Okay. And when you say it's possible, it's also possible that it was not. Correct. In fact, it's a form of speculation, is it not? It's a form of demonstration to show a possibility, yes. Which is a form of speculation since you don't know, right? Right. <laughs> now, sir. You can't testify that this duct tape had anything to do with Kaylee's death, can you, sir? No. Okay. In fact, you can't even testify or base anything scientific that that tape was associated with Kaylee after her death. Can, can you I'll ask that again, question. please? Sure. Sure. You don't know if that duct tape had anything to do with the disposal or the death. True. Okay. And in fact, I'm going to, I'm going to draw a, I guess a, a model here and I'd like to see if you agree with the facts. Okay. okay. You're, you understand that Kaylee was found on the surface, correct? Correct. And that below the surface was the hair mat. Correct. No. Above the surface, I meant, sorry. Yes. Right? Okay. <laughs> Right. And then after that was the mandible. Yes. And then above that was the skull. Correct. Okay. Now, generally speaking, when a person is alive, their hair is on top of their head. Correct. Okay. So somehow, actually, I forgot to mention the duct tape was also found in front, like that, attached to the hair, correct? Correct, across the front. Okay. These multiple problems tonight. 
Can everyone see that okay or want to pull it closer? Yeah. And it cl put it closer to the chair. Can everyone see that okay? Mm -hmm. as, as I mentioned earlier, sir, the hair is generally up here. Correct. Right? That I can uh, see it too. Sure. Slightly. Sorry. Is that better? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I don't want to exclude any. No. Everyone can see that okay? Okay. I, I cannot. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that might help. Yeah. How about the, That's may good. the witness stand down, Your Honor? The witness may stand down. Sir, you stand down, Sir, when you stand down you're going to have to face in the direction of the court reporter so she will be able to see and hear you. Now, sir. As we mentioned, the duct tape was attached to her hair, correct? That's my understanding from uh, observing the photographs. Okay. And that's really the only thing, let me rephrase that. Um, it was your understanding too, based on uh, consultation and the evidence at the scene, is that at one time her skull was inside of uh, three bags, correct? Objection. Hearsay. Speculation. Who? Sustain but rephrase the question. Yes, sir. Based on the evidence that you were given to make your, uh, to, to form your opinions, it's your understanding that uh, Kaylee, Kaylee Marie Anthony's remains at one time were in uh, three bags, correct? That is my understanding, yes. And it is the understanding that there are there is a canvas bag. Were you able to see that canvas bag? Only photographs. Okay. And that canvas bag had a shape, like a round cylinder shape, correct? Like that as an opening? The photographs that I saw were not clear in terms of what the opening looked like. Okay. Uh, were you able to see the handles of the, of the bag? I uh, don't recall handles. Okay. Do you recall if that bag, uh, was it, are you able to close that bag? Again, I've only seen photographs of the bag, so. Uh, so you know. have no idea as to whether the bag was closable? I do not. Okay. And you have no idea as to whether this tape was used to wrap Kaylee's remains or whether the duct tape was in the anatomical position of which it was found because, of course, you did not see the remains as they were decomposed. Objection. Correct. Compound argumentative assumes facts, not in evidence. Sustain. Rephrase the question. Yes, sir. <laughs> you have no idea the placement of that duct tape. The duct tape was over the, at least over the mandible and some portion of the maxilla. Okay. Now, but that's because it was attached to the hair, was it not? I make that statement on the fact that the mandible was found articulated with the skull. And while we're talking about the skull, there's absolutely no way that the hair would have gotten underneath all of this because the body wouldn't have decomposed in that way. Isn't that true, sir? Objection assumes facts, not in evidence. I could explain more at the bench. Approach. Thank you. Sir, I'm going to show you uh, state's evidence 218. May I approach the witness? You may. Right, do I to... No, sir. No, sir. Okay. Thank you. Now, that's a photograph where you can clearly see the hair mat, correct? Correct. And that hair mat was on the floor off of, in the wooded area off Suburban Drive, correct? Yeah. The, the... Photograph is not a suburban drive, and the document speaks for itself. The photograph 
So. Your Honor, I would object to the speaking objections. Overall, let's continue. When this, when the skull was found, the hair mat was on the floor, correct? On the surface, yes. yes. On the surface, excuse me, of the surface. And right slightly above it was the mandible, correct? Based on the photographs that I've seen, I was not at the scene. I understand. Mm -hmm. But based on what you know. Yeah. Okay. So in order for the hair mat to be underneath the skull, it's clearly underneath the skull, is it not? Yes. Okay. So in order for the, for the hair mat to be underneath the skull, on the floor, something had to have made it either roll there or put that in that, put the hair in that position, correct? Yes. And the duct tape also made its way in that direction with the hair, did it not? Toward the surface, you correct. mean? Correct. Toward the surface. Correct. That's what I meant. Mm -hmm. Okay. May I get the photograph? You may. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now the video you showed, again, uh, of the possibility that that duct tape could have been in that position was quite graphic, was it not? It was. Okay. And was it to try and appeal to the jury's emotions when you asked Mr. Ashton to do that? Objection. Decisions of what may be appropriate. You may. Yes. <laughs> Members of the jury, would you step out for a minute, please? You may be seated. You may proceed with your proffer. Yes, sir. Dr. Warren, you testified earlier that it, that it was under your suggestion that this movie be prepared, correct? Yes. Okay. And when you had that discussion with Mr. Ashton, was it for the purpose of appealing to the jury? No. Okay. Was it for the purpose to demonstrate to the jury something of a graphic nature? No. Was it for the purpose of getting sympathy or getting the jury angry? No. Okay. And it was just for the mere possibility of showing that the duct tape could have possibly covered the nose and mouth. That's correct. I have no further questions. Sir. Question. Okay. Check and see if the jury is ready to come back in. I think they use a cover break. Since got All right. Why don't y'all take a five minute break and we'll get started at 20 minutes past. State recognized presence of jury. Yes, sir. And does uh, the defense. Yes, sir, we do. Mr. Baez, you may continue, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Dr. Warren, I just have a couple more questions. Uh, you're aware that another piece of Hankel duct tape was found nine feet away, correct? I was not aware of that. Oh, okay. Um, now, the possibility of this uh, demonstration that you did. Uh, that was just, of course, one possibility, correct? Asked and answered. Overall. <laughs> one possibility. The demonstration, the, the quick time video that you did, that was just one possibility. It's demonstrating one possibility, correct? True. Okay. <laughs> and there are other possible scenarios uh, that could be involved with both Kaylee's death, correct? Correct. And also the duct tape, correct? In terms of the position of the duct tape over the face, no. No, what I'm saying is that there are other possibilities, since you don't know the history of where the duct tape was originally, there are other possibilities that could involve that duct tape. Of course. Okay. And you don't have any quick time movies of those, do you, sir? No, sir. All right, thank you. I have no further questions. Redirect. Doctor, do you have an opinion as to whether the duct tape was placed on Kaylee Anthony before decomposition? Yes. 
What is that opinion? It was placed on prior to decomposition. What do you base that on? Uh, on the fact that the mandible was found. Oh, we're uh, on uh, the position of the mandible uh, still articulated with the rest of the cranium. Uh, on a surface deposition, skeletal elements get moved around. They get moved around by scavengers, insects. Uh, that mandible will always become disarticulated unless it is held in place by something. And in this case, can you see anything holding it in place other than the duct tape? No, sir. Now, you're not saying the duct tape was actually stuck to the bones. It was never stuck to the bone, no, sir. So how does the duct tape during decomposition keep the mandible in place? The mandible's probably stuck to the soft tissue uh, as well as the hair. And then when the soft tissue decomposes, the duct tape stays in place and, and, and supplies some um, sort of support for the, uh, for the mandible. Now, Mr. Ruck, could we have um, states, public states 218, please, Your Honor, in evidence? States uh, Exhibit 218, the photograph. Okay. Pull it up and make sure. <clears throat> you need the. Uh, Now, Doctor, this is the photograph that you were shown by Mr. Byers. I'm going to publish it to the jury now. Right. Is that correct? Correct. Now, this photograph shows that the hair, in fact, is not under the mandible, but, but posterior to the mandible. Is that correct? correct? It's under the base of the skull. Not under the mandible? Correct. Now, how during decomposition does the hair end up not on top of the scalp? Uh, the hair is attached to hair follicles on the galial uh, or, or scalp tissue. When that tissue decomposes, it tends to slide down. Uh, and so it's not uncommon to find uh, what essentially looks like a bird's nest of hair uh, settled around the base of, uh, of a skeletal element or skull. As we see here it, around the, the back of the base of the skull? Yes. And is that a, something you commonly see in... Um, Decom decomposition elements where the hair basically just falls back and creates a nest. Correct. Just like that. Yes, hair uh, preserves fairly well and lasts a while. Yeah. It preserves fairly well. It lasts a while. No further questions. Mm -hmm. Mr. Baez? You, we can leave, we can bring that back up. Yes. Okay, yes, sir. Thank you. You want to publish, Mr. Baez? Yes, sir. 218? 218, sir. Okay, publish. Can you see that, sir? Yes. Can the ladies and gentlemen of the jury see it? Yes. Now, there is significant root growth underneath the mandible as well, correct? Uh, I do see some roots there. Okay. Um, and roots underneath the mandible can also, in conjunction with, well, actually, let me ask you this. You see roots also attached to the hairnet, do you not? I do. Okay. The roots could also contribute to keeping the mandible in place, could it not, sir? As it is in, demonstrated in this photograph. That's possible. Yes. Okay, we can unpublish it. And the statement that you say, uh, well, if I can have just a moment, Judge. Right. I have no further questions. Thank you, Judge. Second. Okay. Does active decomposition inhibit plant growth? No. Could those roots have grown? calls for an opinion outside of this witness's expertise. This. Sustain, establish a foundation for him to answer the question. I'll, I'll just move on to another question, Judge. Okay. 
I guess what I'm going to ask you is, can the, the roots can't grow in the hair until the hair has already fallen off the skull, correct? I think sustain unless you establish your foundation as to the base of his knowledge and his qualifications to give well, an expert okay. opinion. Are you familiar at all with plant growth involving decomposition? Is that something you normally see? Yes. Okay. Um, you're not a botanist? No. But have you had experience in evaluating plant growth in the context of taphonomy of remains? Yes, and locating graves and uh, changes in the environment in general. All right. Now, I guess my question is, Mr. Baez asked you if the roots in the hairball could keep the mandible in place. You said it could, correct? It's possible. I, I would say roots can keep, uh, would keep a mandible in place under certain circumstances. I would say that's possible, yes. But what has to happen before the roots can do that in this case? What would have to happen? Does the hair have to first fall off? Yes. Okay. My point is, until that point, there's nothing for the roots to grow in. Correct. So the only thing that would be holding the bandwidth in place is what? The tape. Thank you. Any additional questions? Two, two areas that he covered that I'd like to ask you on. Number one, you're not a botanist. Correct. And forensic botany is a whole nother field, correct? Correct. And you would defer to a botanist as yeah. to those opinions? Yes, I would. Okay. Uh, second of all, you can't, based on the evidence, the limited evidence that you have, know the tracking of that duct tape, can you, sir? Because you don't know where it was originally at to begin with. The the tracking. Yeah. Kind of Where uh, you can't testify as to the positioning of the body at any at any point in time, can no. you, sir? Okay. Just, yeah. And you can't testify as to uh, where the hair was at one time or another. No. And all we have at, at this point are photographs that you've observed of duct tape stuck to hair. Correct. No further questions. Okay, may the doctor be excused. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Warren. You may be excused, sir.